Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to No DQ and A video, episode number 537, right here on NoDQ.com, as well as the YouTube channel and No DQ and A videos affiliate, ringsidenews.com. Got your questions here regarding Raw and Hell in the Cell and some other topics, including a TNA topic because we just had Bound for Glory this past Sunday. So let's get started here today with the first one from Mike Scott 912 Hey Aaron, what were your thoughts on Raw this week? I personally thought it was one of the better shows lately. It was also nice to see celebrity guests not make complete jackasses out of themselves through horrible gimmicks. Please answer in video. I do think it was one of the better Raws of the past two months. I think that it was solid in terms of building up the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. And as you mentioned, the celebrity guests, I forgot their names, but they were there at ringside. I think that it's best to keep the celebrity roles to a minimum, especially if your so-called celebrity is not that much of a celebrity to begin with, and also if that celebrity is not much of a wrestling fan. It just depends on the person. Sometimes you have a celebrity guest host or guest star who is a huge fan of wrestling and actually understands professional wrestling, and they can go out there and not be embarrassing. Guys like Shaq. Shaq came out. He did a tremendous job. And there were other guys, you know, Bob Barker did really well when he was the guest host. So it just depends on the person. There were some guys that did absolutely terrible, like Jeremy Piven, guys who were clearly just there to promote their own project and nothing else. Um, so, you know, the way they did it this week was fine. As long as you don't have people that are getting in the ring, being in long segments that don't really know what they're doing, uh, it's okay to have guest hosts or guest celebrity appearances every now and then. All right, this one comes from Trav JC27. Hey, Aaron, what a surprise. Orton versus Cena for the millionth time. The only thing that can save this match is a face turn by Randy. Do you think that this is the time to do it? Yeah, I've gotten a lot of questions about Orton versus Cena, my thoughts on that. I mean, whatever. At least we're getting... Dean Ambrose versus Seth Rollins inside the Hell in the Cell, which I felt was the right decision. That's the match WWE should be doing as the headlining match. Uh, but it does mean we're getting Orn versus Cena yet again. I think it's like the 24th pay-per-view match that the two of them have been involved with, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or some kind of tag team match or Fatal 4-Way or whatever. So they have been in the ring together at least 24 times, or they will be in the ring together 24 times. And I think that this is like the 10th singles match on pay-per-view between the two of them. It's definitely overkill. I'm so sick to death of it, but at least we're getting Rollins versus Ambrose. And to me, that should be the main event. That should be the match that carries the show. And I think that that's the match that people will be anticipating the most. That's the important match that needs to deliver. Orn versus Cena, they can just go out there and do their usual shtick. Uh, actually, their second, not just uh, their 10th singles match, but their second Hell in a Cell match now. So I'm not sure what they can do to make that different from the first Hell in a Cell match. It's, it's just so ridiculous. Uh, but I don't even care. If, if Orn and Cena just go out there and have their standard match, as long as, as, long as Ambrose versus Rollins delivers, I can put up with another Orn versus Cena match. Whatever. All right, this one comes from Kai BF. Really, another Orton versus Cena to add to the anthology. Would have preferred one multi-man Hell in a Cell with Ambrose and Rollins in it as well. Anyways, the only good I see coming out of it, out of Orton versus Cena, is Orton winning and turning face to fight Brock in his hometown at Survivor Series. I I uh, forgot to mention in the previous question the idea of a Randy Orton face turn. You know, that's something that's been speculated. Right now, it's looking like Brock Lesnar's not coming back until the Royal Rumble. That's the speculation right now in WWE that they're just going to keep him away until the Royal Rumble. Sounds to me like WWE is being cheap and they just don't want to pay the extra money to have Brock Lesnar around, which I think is a huge mistake. I think that you're failing to capitalize on a big-time matchup between Brock Lesnar and Randy Orton for the WWE title. Um, so if, if Brock's not coming back till the Rumble... I really don't see a point in turning Randy Orton babyface again. He had just gone back to being a heel a year ago. All right, this next one comes from K Fabe Candy Ass. What do you think of Justin Roberts not being resigned? 
Honestly, I never thought he had the right voice for the job. He's still better than TNA's guy. And why did he always have to say crap like, he is the viper, he is the game, he is this, he is that, lame. I was definitely surprised to hear about Justin Roberts not being resigned to a new deal. I think that he did a very good job as announcer in WWE. I think that he wasn't at the level of Howard Finkel in terms of being memorable, but I still feel that he did a very solid job and uh, he seemed to be very well liked and somebody who was passionate about his job. I'm, I'm just a bit surprised. I, I'm not sure who replaces him at this point. I got this question from Calvin Bowman 1. Hey, Aaron, who will replace Justin Roberts as the ring announcer for Raw? Who will be a great choice and, and why? I'm not sure what's going to happen now. I'm, I'm guessing for the time being, Lillian Garcia will step in and be the lead announcer as she's been in the past. Um, you know, I'd be really surprised if they brought back Finkel. That I don't see happening. And uh, you still have Tony Chimmel around, so they could have him do the announcing. Or they could bring in somebody entirely new, and perhaps that has something to do with WWE not renewing Justin Roberts. Maybe they just want to um, get somebody else who will work cheaper. I mean, who knows? But, um, you know, I'm sure they'll find somebody, whether it's Lillian or they bring in somebody entirely different. All right, this one comes from Wrestling God 88. I've noticed on TV, on TV that WWE hasn't been plugging the network as often. With the recent roll out of the network worldwide, do you think that WWE is now making a profit off of the network? Well, I, I don't think that they're making enough money from the WWE network considering the recent development that they are going to be putting limited advertising during WWE shows and video on demand and whatnot. So they're, they're still trying to uh, generate more revenue from the network. And we won't really know until the worldwide numbers are released how well they're doing. I'm assuming that the worldwide um, increase will help matters. But to me, the fact that they're, they're doing the, the advertising on the network, that, that's a sign that they still don't, they, they don't have enough of the subscriber count that they need yet to really uh, make this thing work in the long run. And, and you know, it, it just depends. I mean, I think that if, if the situation calls for it, they're going to keep plugging the network. Um, if, if they're able to increase their subscribers, uh, they'll, they'll back down a little bit. Um, you know, they, they still did the $9.99 on Raw, so they're, they're still mentioning it. But I think they realize that at some point, they got to they gotta cut back a little bit or they're really going to irritate their fan base to the point of no return. All right, this one comes from WWE Fan 5. Hey, Aaron, Paul Burchill was very underrated in my opinion. Do you agree? I think that Paul Burchill was entertaining when he was doing that whole pirate gimmick. Before that, I mean, to me, he was just another guy on the roster. But uh, I did enjoy the pirate gimmick. It did have a short shelf life, but I feel that that was uh, a gimmick that probably wasn't meant to be anything serious. But I think that it was entertaining and it was something different. So I, I was a fan of the pirate gimmick, and I actually wish it had lasted a little bit longer. But, um, you know, sometimes you have a guy and he's not going anywhere. And you just got to give him a gimmick. And uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. All right, this one comes from Wrestling Do 95 Yoram, what are your thoughts on the Bound for Glory pay-per-view and what was your favorite match? Well, I actually did not watch the entire show. I've only seen highlights, maybe about 10, 15 minutes of the show. And uh, based on what I saw, it looked like the best match was the triple threat with Samoa Joe and Low Key. And um, that's what most people have told me, that that was their favorite match on the show. I mean... The thing about the Bound for Glory pay-per-view is it, it just didn't feel like anything special. It felt like TNA went to Japan and it, it felt more like an indie wrestling show than TNA's Super Bowl, their big show of the year, their version of WrestleMania. Just didn't have that feeling. You didn't have any storyline build up for the matches. It, it just felt like a indie house show that was broadcast on pay-per-view. And... Um, you know, didn't really feel it was a priority, and um, why should I feel like it's a priority when TNA didn't feel like it was a priority? Um, so I'm hopeful that 
things will work out with them and uh, they'll be able to get a new TV deal. And I really hope that TNA can turn around to the point where they can go back to doing live monthly pay-per-views because, I mean, TNA has really suffered without the pay-per-views, in my opinion. The pay-per-views help keep people invested in the product and it gives them something to look forward to. But I'm not really sure how TNA can even go back to that because, you know, the pay-per-views with WWE Network now, the $9.99 a month, um, how can TNA charge $50 a month for a pay-per-view and get people to watch? I'm sure there's, you know, 5,000 people out there that will buy any TNA pay-per-view for any price, but uh, it, it, it's just not that feasible for TNA at this point. I'm really hopeful they'll be able to find some way to have a big monthly show on pay-per-view and, and keep some kind of steady momentum and keep the storytelling going and just be able to thrive as a promotion. And right now it's not looking good, but I'm still uh, hopeful that something will happen that's positive in TNA. All right, this one comes from 2Tag. Hey, Aaron, greetings from the UK. I would like to ask you, what is your feeling about Miz Dow? Personally, I like his gimmick. Watched Miz match against Sheamus on Raw, and Miz Dow was acting Miz's actions, and it made me LOL. I think Miz might turn on him. Um, well, regarding Miz Dow, I actually do find it to be entertaining. Um, you know, I think that it's not really good for Damian Sandow in terms of being a long-term major superstar, but... At least he's got something to do, and I, I think he does the role well, and uh, I think it's funny. It's, it's something different. I mean, we've never had this kind of gimmick where a guy acts as a stunt double and, and imitates him. I mean, it brings Miz down, too. I mean, both of them. It, it basically makes them comedy wrestlers, but uh, at least it's something for them to do. I mean, WWE really had no uh, plans for either guy to be a top star, so why not just be creative and do something different with them. So, I mean, it is entertaining and it, it's better than them not doing anything at all. And it was better than what Miz was doing before uh, being the punching bag for everybody. I, I think that this is a better role. All right, final question here. Not sure if you've answered this before. After Undertaker and Kane both are in the Hall of Fame, could you see the Brothers of Destruction inducted as a tag team? I think that you could do that, but to me inducting both of them into the Hall of Fame as a tag team. I mean, that that's really, really pushing it, I think. It's not really necessary because, yes, they were dominant together, but when you think of Undertaker and Kane, you think of the rivalry between the two of them. And I think that WWE would only do that if they were really desperate for people to induct into the Hall of Fame. And if you're not desperate, I, I don't think that there's a need to induct the Brothers of Destruction. I think it, you're fine just having Undertaker go in and Kane go in at some point. Uh, you know, as a tag team, there's plenty of other tag teams out there that were very high profile that haven't gone into the Hall of Fame yet that should be. So I think that those people, you know, tag teams like Demolition, they should be going in before the Brothers of Destruction. So if it does happen, probably not going to happen for a very long time, if at all. So that'll do it for this edition of No dq and a video. Thanks as always for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. YouTube.com slash NoDQCW or click the subscribe button. Stay tuned to NoDQ.com for the very latest in WWE and TNA. And I will see you guys next time for more.